is in hot pursuit of the man of her choice. In spite of the pressures of, uh, pressures of the male-dominated world, the young females are on their way to get what they want, as we see. In this play, Shakespeare also sets up a binary opposition between the practices of a male-dominated society and that of the supernatural world by focusing on the fact that in human society, even females with mythological dimensions, like Hippolyta, the queen of the Amazons, are forced to put up with the male authority of kings like Theseus, and when necessary, their violence. While in the supernatural world, King Oberon can get what he wants only by playing clever tricks on his queen, Titania. So there's more democracy in the natural and the supernatural world, in nature and in the supernatural world. Shakespeare contrasts the different attitudes of the royal female in Richard III, this is the only history play I'm going to mention, by drawing a binary opposition between Lady Anne and Queen Elizabeth, the widow of Edward IV, in the two parallel wooing scenes, one at the beginning, the other towards the end of the play. In the earlier scene, Lady Anne is portrayed as a typical feudal female who, unable to survive without the protection of a powerful male, will be ending up in misery, while Elizabeth, acting on behalf of her daughter in the second, manages to outwit Richard and ward off the traps he has laid. In measure and in measure for measure, there's a strange situation. We have a perfect heroine, Isabella. This Isabella is about to take an oath for religious devotion. But she finds herself torn between losing her virginity and saving her brother Claudio from execution. With the help of the Duke, disguised as a priest, she manages to smooth out the problems that stand on her way. So, till the end of the play, she remains a woman with a good moral judgment, a virgin, very important in the feudal world, a good sister that can save her brother from his and a, a friend who can protect other girls or females from male traps. So Shakespeare most probably thought she had to be rewarded. But we were all, as audience, we, or as leaders, we were all thinking that she would finally say, okay, my mission is over, everything has been smoothed out, so I'm going back to my monastery. But at that point, the Duke stops her and makes her a proposal of marriage. But that doesn't make us happy at all. This is how I worded it. Yet whether the Duke's last minute proposal of marriage that she cannot possibly refuse because the Duke had his, anyway, he's the greatest authority in the society and at the same time, he has been helping her throughout the play. So he couldn't be refused. But whether this proposal of marriage pleases Isabella or not is left to the choice of the stage direction. The way she asks, the, he asks the actress, uh, to pose and to act. For the reader, however, 
it strikes an unpleasant chord because Isabella is not free to do what she wants and she is forced to remain within the limits of the feudal world and strangely enough, she remains absolutely quiet in this scene that ends the play. So we never know whether she's happy about this marriage. Most probably, since she was the purest creature in that corrupted society, she needed to be awarded uh, by becoming the Duchess, most probably. But still, we wonder. The contrasting attitudes between conventional couples whose marriage arrangements are made by their elders and those who need the support of romantic courtship for an ideal marriage abound in Shakespearean comedy and is climactic in Much Ado About Nothing. In this play, Claudio and Hero represent the stereotypes of the conventional couple whose marital concern is limited to establishing a proper match. While in the relationship between Benedict and Beatrice, romantic courtship is skillfully masked by the witty dialogue, one of the greatest examples of the war of the sexes, until the couple realizes that their love is mutual. That's one point against the modern aspirations of the female. That romantic courtship is most ardently desired by women, and that unlike Romeo and Lysander of a Midsummer Night's Dream, who excel in wooing, males usually fall short of finding proper ways of expressing their feelings. And Shakespeare shows them in two comedies as follows. In As You Like It and Twelfth Light, in which through the two females disguised as males, Shakespeare provides for us a master class in romantic wooing. Uh, the authors are women, not the males. Rosalind, discussed as Ganymede in the former play, teaches her loved one, Orlando, how to approach the girl he loves. Viola, disguised as Cesario in the latter play, woos Olivia on behalf of Count Orsino. Her wooing is so effective that Olivia, thinking he's a man, falls in love with Viola. Luckily, Viola's identical twin brother, Sebastian, appears soon and marries Olivia. Viola's share in this game of love is Orsino, with whom she has been infatuated since the very beginning. Orsino gets the girl without even a single sentence of uh, expressing romantic courtship. It is through the romantic endeavors and tricks of the female that the hard cores of the patriarchal world are cracked and marriages based on the woman's <coughs> choice are made possible. Another step towards modernity. Women achieving an equal status with man is shown in two other comedies, Merchant of Venice and All's Well That Ends Well. In The Merchant, Portia starts as a victim as the, of the patriarchal world who, upon her father's will, is doomed to be the prize for the suitor who chooses the right casket. Then she enjoys the good fortune of being won by Pastanio, the man of her choice. Next, in trying to free Pastanio's friend Antonio from Shylock's clutches, she assumes the guise of a lawyer 
and enters the male world by making use of the knowledge she receives from a profession. Her success with Antonio's case in the guise of a lawyer enables her to trick her husband to be into remaining loyal to her, remember the ring trick, all his life. Her promotion from the helpless virgin treated by her father as a weak link who cannot make her own decisions into a woman who demands the absolute loyalty of her husband is by all means admirable. Yet, the way she adopts the cruelty of the male world in her ruthless treatment of Shylock leaves an unpleasant impression on the audience. And Portia remains a girl, not so much a character, not so much life. Uh, within the Shakespearean canon. In All is Well, on the other hand, Helena begins by practicing the art of curing illnesses that she has learned from her deceased father. Upon curing the king of France, she is to be rewarded what her heart desires most. Her choice is marriage with Bertram, which award the king readily grants. Thus, by adopting the practices of the male-dominated world, Helena upsets the whole social scale and upgrades the position of women. Yet the mentality behind forcing a man to marriage makes her an unpleasant woman, just as a man forcing a woman to marry him would. In fact, Bertram, who does not love her, tries in vain to avoid her by going to war. Helena in All is Well is one of the earliest dramatic